the ability of this today to see George and some of his uh, exploits during the war and his training. He's open to questions later on, so there's anything you want to ask. And one of the things that he can offer you is that unique opportunity of what was it like? When did you have your breakfast? When did you know where you were going to bomb? What happened? How long did your training last? All those things that you very rarely get to read in a book. You can ask the person who was actually involved in that. George has got a huge history uh, behind him uh, in the Royal Air Force. Navigation, so he's navigated over Germany during the war. He's navigated uh, Britannia's, uh, Sunderland's, Anson's, Meteor's, the list is endless. I don't want to take away from what I was going to talk about later on. Uh, but he's got a huge history of things that he's, he's flown. So what we're going to do, first of all, we're going to do a presentation for sort of 30 minutes, 45 to 45 minutes. Once we've done that, we'll have a break. Uh, we've got past EPs and some other things on as well. You're quite welcome to. For our visitors, it's a pound. Okay, if you can get two passes for a pound, be my guess, but it's a good do. And we've also got some drinks for our money canteen. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce George Davis uh, and his presentation for tonight. Thank you, George. Good evening. Good evening, Good evening all the cadet staff and officers, um, and a special welcome to Barry. There's always been a, f a fall in my side regards the band. We've tried to fight you over the years, but I've succumbed now that uh, we're, we're both as good as one another. Anyway, uh, you might see the title there, it's, it's called the Bomber Battle of Berlin. It's not actually this pr presentation, but it's a part of the um, presentation that I can use for this talk tonight. So uh, we'll not just cover the, the Berlin bombing, which is um, a bit of my life. But um, I think what I want to do is to introduce myself, and at the same time, if, I, if this one comes up. Right. Um, while I'm talking to you, just short history going up to the time that uh, I came up with Operation Flying. But um, I was born in 1923 and um, I was a young lad of about 16 and a half when the war broke out in Germany. And uh, at that time, we were still like you, enjoying life in general. Um, one second. Oh, come back, oh, come back, come back. Um, what happened was, is that uh, when the war broke out, I was still at navigational school. I was training to be a, a, mer a merchant navy navigator. I had sights of being a captain of a ship, sailing the Pacific with all the hula hula girls. And it was all denied me, unfortunately, because my mother wouldn't let me go to sea. So. When the Blitz started in 1940, and London had it for about six or seven months non-stop every night, down the shelter, this was no life at all. But uh, unfortunately, we did get a direct hit on the home, so this stirred me up and I said, Mum won't let me go to sea, I shall join the Air Force with my friend. Now, our object was to be ground gunners, which is the forerunner of the RAF regiment. But when I went into the office for recruiting in Houston Station, I went before the board. There was a squadron leader, which I didn't know at that time, two flight lieutenants. And they said, why do you want to join as an air governor and ground gunner? I said, I want to short load, shoot those devils down that done damage to our home. So with that, he said, um, would you like to be an, uh, an observer in the Air Force? And I thought, well, what's this air observer this is? And I thought to my father's war, where they sat in a balloon and just pointed where the artillery was going to fire and shoot down the Germans there. And I wasn't going to sit in a balloon at uh, 8,000 feet with bullets rocketing down the, um, the balloon. So I said, I don't want that shot. So he said, oh, it's totally different to what you think. You were an observer, and what you did, you did the navigation, the bombing, and the signalling all in one, because it was in the early days of the war, and we did not have any heavy bombers at that time. We had Hamptons, Herefords, and Beauforts, and that's about the only thing we had. They were a three-man crew. So anyway, can you go back on this uh, one water? Go back to the other screen, that screen. Yeah. Yeah. 
Anyway, with this, I, I can't tend to do this. And at the age when I was um, joining up, was it um, something like about 16 to 17 that I wanted to get in. And finally, they let me into the Air Force at 17 and a half years of age. Uh, then we've gone back a bit. Anyway, I'll continue the story. It's, I went home on, and uh, sat around for a few months till I got called up. And then I was taken away to South Africa to do my flying training. And I sailed out on the wonderful convoy of about 42 ships with a ring of destroyers around us. And they were guarding us all the way to uh, South Africa. Well, nobody knew we were going there. I couldn't tell my parents we were going. But um, I went out on an old banana boat called the Volendam, which was finally sunk. But uh, the thing was, we had did a, done a little bit of training in England. And whilst we were on the boat for six weeks to get to Durban, we were told to keep classes going. And we were allowed to use a sextant. One of the things we were doing, we were working out British Bean Time, which we still got wearing our watches, and we had these sextants, and we were shooting the, the sun around about noon time, and we were finding the proximal position of the, the convoy um, between us at about, uh, within about 50 miles of where it was in the Atlantic. And we were selling these positions to the soldiers we had on board that were going out to Africa. And we sold them for six bits a piece today's position. <laughs> and um, consequently, we are making a little bit of money on the side. But I don't think the captain of the ship was quite happy about his position being given away. But nobody had any access to, um, to wireless or that. Arrived in Durban, after about 10 months of training there, I went out in the July and came back in the March of 1943. And when I was, um, arrived back in England, I went up to um, Scotland um, at a place called Dun... 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 I'm going back 92 years of my life, so my memory is getting a little bit short. Um, Dun... 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 Anyway, we went, I went up there and uh, we kind of got some basic training back over England and finally um, we arrived down into Lincolnshire where we were sent to a place called Wigsley. Now, we had no crews at all, but a load of pilots, a load of navigators and a load of signalers and a load of gunners were all bunged up in this big hangar and uh, Wigsley and you had to sort yourself out into a crew. It wasn't um, forceful. Somebody would come up to me and say, have you got a pilot? I say, no. Well, he said, I've got a pilot, a nice lad over there. So you went across and say, do you want a navigator? Do you want a signaler? And that's how the crew was formed. Now, you must remember that we're all about 18 years of age at that stage. And uh, consequently, we're all young boys, all, all out for a bit of fun, and thought, well, if we get a good crew here, we can have a good party together. Well, we did. And just in the picture here, this is when I came home and from South Africa in '43. And you notice I was wearing a, an O, and that's the observer's wing. Well, the Air Force at that time decided with the influx of the four engine bombers that were going to come into force um, the Sterling, the Lancaster, the Halifax they were going to split the crews up so that you roughly had a seven-man crew and each was uh, dedicated to his own trade. Being a pre-war sea navigator, um, I was then shoved into the navigational branch and I finished up as a navigator. So this is a part of my crew here. Um, the one on the left is a little Irish lad and he was our mid-upper gunner and that was me in the middle. I was a GP, and uh, the lad at the end was a, an ex-post office worker, and he was my flight engineer. Oops. Anyway, oops, I don't know what that It's not going to hit too fast here. Um, having crewed up, and we spent a bit of time together, we went up to a place called um, East Berkeley and joined the squadron. When we joined the squadron, the first thing we did was have a shakedown and put billets. And uh, it was there about three days. 
my first trip was uh, supposed to be a nursery slope. And we went into the briefing room and there was this massive great map on the wall with a big line going through it and it was going to Berlin. And the first trip I ever did over Germany was to the big city as we called it at that time. Now, just um, reflecting back to my um, earlier days, I spent a lot of time training down at places like Eastbourne, Brighton, and um, West Kirby, was it West Kirby we went up to? And that was another place, all building up to the stage where we would go on to um, our flying training. Now, my flying training, going back again a bit, as I said, was in South Africa. And I thoroughly enjoyed it out there because England at that time was heavily Russian in darkness. And when I arrived in South Africa, it was a land of daylight. There were fruit, food, cinemas were open, pubs were open, everything like that. But um, after about, uh, what, about eight or nine minutes, you know, I knew we were going home. I thought, well, I'd like to stay here for the rest of my days. But um, when we were given our brevies, we had a big presentation parade. And I, one of the unique things about it that was presented to me, my wing, by a person called um, General Smuts. Now, I don't think you all know about General Smuts, but he was the Prime Minister of South Africa at the time. And he fought against the English in the Boer War. And uh, he was a, a real true Dutch uh, South African. So I was very proud of the fact that I got this from my first brevy was from General Smuts. Anyway, coming back to uh, um, England again, now I came home on a ship that now sits in Los Angeles as a hotel. I came home on the old Queen Mary, and there was um, about uh, 200 air crew coming back, and we had four or 5,000 um, personnel of the Italian army that had been captured and bring, bring them back to England to put into presentation camps. So, all we had to do now was stand at the end of the corridor on each of the decks of the Queen Mary, which uh, there was no doors on it, by the way, so it, life was a bit miserable. You could go to the loo and everybody down the road could see what we were doing. Um, but we can't even meet people for that number of um, months but when they were coming back to it. Now, it took six and a half weeks to get to Durban in the convoy, and when we came home, it took 14 days she just steamed her own way across the Atlantic and back to Burwick in Scotland where we just embarked. And there was only one death on board, it was an Italian prisoner who died. And they didn't stop the engines and allow a sea burial, but they did give the land a sea burial with the Italian flag. And they stopped the engines on the road and she just glided on right through the service. And I don't think she lost an ounce of speed. She must have finished up about 25 knots on the first five knots. Um, with the, the shutting down of the engines. Right, getting to the squadron now, what we did on the squadron was this, and I think the CO was more interested in this, is when we arrived there, we were given a flight, and I went into B flight with my crew, and A flight was the uh, other half of the squadron. And we had about um, 14 or eight clusters between us, and there was seven on each crew, um, to each squadron and uh, each flight. And with this, of course, um, it was really um, night after night that you would have to go out on, on the missions. Now, I do believe that um, I do have some listeners here, but I can't actually show you them. But um, you saw some of the targets up there which we did use, and um, the ones we used to go to was mainly. The, the main targets of Germany. All, all the cit cities that we used to bomb were main targets of the industrial areas of Germany. And what would happen is this. You go in down to the flight office in the morning, and there you, you go in and uh, on the main flight office. We all had our own sections, and on the board were all the crews with their names and their aircraft numbers next to them. And if you saw your name up on the operations board, you knew you were on that night. 
you did no more, you had no, no news of what you were going to do because it was still top secret. Now, I was at a camp called East Kirkby in, in Lincolnshire, which is about 10 miles north of Boston and about 20 miles west of um, Skegness. I think you've seen it on the, on the television, the Lancaster that they used for trolling out and doing television things. That, they're the two brothers who maintain that airfield which their father um, owned the land of, and that's where East Kirk is. And it's a preservation um, place now for the Lancasters. And um, the um, uh, operation board was up. Your name was on it, your crew number, your captain, etc., etc., and a briefing time. Now, this would be about 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning. Then you would go back to your billets or whatever, and um, we then would have, um, have a bit of lunch, and you'd have to report for a briefing, say, 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock, whatever the raid was going to be. Then you would have this um, little chat amongst yourselves, and say, I wonder what we're doing tonight, I wonder what we're doing tonight. And uh, then you, after tea, you have a full briefing, and you go into the main hall, there's all the crews there, they pull the curtains aside, and you would see what your target was. Now, the main one during my tour of operations was Berlin. Now, out of the 32 missions that one did, roughly, um, you could go on for war if you could get back on the squadron, but my crew completed 32 missions altogether, and um, out of them, about half of them were roughly over Berlin. So apart from the other main targets we did, always in my mind is the the Berlin bombing at the time. Now, the chief air staff there was uh, Air Chief Marshal um, Bomber Harris, and he had uh, the authority from Churchill to destroy as many of the cities of, of Germany that he could. Never mind about the fixing of the uh, uh, targets, it was Janass bombing. There was no specific targets one would pick out. You just go in on a wave of an aircraft of something like about um, 200 of you in a way. Sorry. <laughs> Come in. <laughs> yeah, um, it'd be about 200 of you in a wave. Now, if you had six to 800 bombers over the target, you can imagine that 200 aircraft coming in at 15 minute intervals, that the, the whole of the city in which you were attacking was absolutely dipped devastated. They couldn't can't fight the fires, the destruction and that, until we'd all cleared out. Now this used to take, bombing raid actually took over the target between 20 minutes and a half an hour. The rest of the time was being en route. So you can imagine the devastation that will be done within that half an hour. Now on the way in one would um, line up for your target and you would find that um, as soon as they found out the direction you were coming in, the fighters would be accumulated now. But uh, I, you all had a good look at the old the, the Lancaster. I don't know if I can get onto the one. Yeah. So I've got some of the, um, about a Lancaster. A bit, it was built by Abrose, of course, just down the road here, Chatterton. And you can see there was, uh, 73, 73, 7,300 built, and out of that, 4,000 were lost. So you can see over half the bomber force was actually devastated. Um, we flew into the target area at heights between 18 and 25,000 feet. Um, you were given an altitude to fly in at over the target, but uh, one would uh, get the captain to inch it up a little bit because, he, you know, the higher you flew, the, the further away the flat was at the ground. And uh, we split, flew at a speed about 225, which is about 240 miles an hour. Now the takeoff weight was 65,000 pounds, of which of that half of it was your bomb load. Um, and we carried the types of bombs, as you can see, is the cookie, which is that great big long barrel thing, um, and then the uh, 12,000 pound and a tall boy was actually shaped like a bomb and it was designed to destroy the, um, the submarine pens and all that. 
And finally, they brought out the £22,000 bomb, which was to destroy the viaducts of the um, valleys and that, which they did. And a very number of incendiary bombs. Now, you uh, had to carry all these up on the airplane, and you're sitting on quite a fair load of HE, heavy explosives, which is quite frightening at times. Um, this is the squadron I served on, which was um, 630 squadron, the half past six squadron, as we call it. And um, it was formed from um, one of the old squadrons over at uh, Scampton Way and split into two. And uh, as you see, not 200 miles, death by night. There's the history of it there. It was formed from 50 squadron, 57 squadron and um, split up into two flights for. Right, 1943 winter was one of the worst winters they had throughout the war. And as you can see, everybody, and they're not only the ground crew there that are shoveling away, you had to do some of this a couple of hours in the early afternoon before you could go flying at night. And uh, as a consequence was, you were a little bit nagged at the time you had to get airborne. And invariably, you went off at, at dusk or um, even later. Now, there's some of the bombing up of the uh, aircraft. There's, there's the cookie. It's the big round one. It has got the lower area of nautical aspects. It's just a tin drum, two-thirds of it with bomb, um, AG, and the last third of it was an empty can. So it just used to roll over in the sky till it hit the um, detonators, those three little pimples on the end, and it would blow a hole in the ground about 400 feet wide. Um, the other ones were the type of um, lighter bombs, but also ground in the bomb bay, you would be packed with lots of high incendiaries. And these high incendiaries would hit the ground after the bomb went off, because you carried them that little bit further, and quite, as a result, you had a great big fire burning, and nobody could get near the buildings to save anybody else who was inside it. There's a crew at startup. This is my crew, by the way. I, I, it's a crew that I just found in the picture. Um, as a matter of fact, you didn't hang around on the squadron. I was on the squadron for about eight months, and now to that time, we were the first crew to finish a tour of operations. There was a uh, Crews would arrive on a morning, and uh, before they got their bedding in, in the, where they were going to be bedded down for the night, they would leave their suitcases in the mess hall and uh, go off to briefing. And I've come back from many a raid and found the su suitcases still standing in the hallway. But unfortunately, they never, never came home. So they had to contact the parents or their wives and that, and send, uh, send their baggage home to them to keep us up. So, as a result, you, you can see quite soon. Um, this was my first raid. This was my nursery raid. It was on the first week in December. I should never regret it. It was snowing as I went out to the airplane, and I thought, oh, they're going to scrub it, please. <laughs> so I, I thought I was going to do a little one across the, the channel and got my bombs. But as you can see, they dispatched 450 aircraft that night, and it was 425 Lancasters and 50 Malacca, 18 mosquitoes. And the voltage was 43% of that. Over the target to, to 2004 to 2024, you can see it was 20 minutes for those 500 aircraft nearly to dispose of their bombs and get away from the target area. They lost 40 aircraft that night, 37 Lancasters, Halifaxes, and Mosquito. When you multiply that 40 by 7, in one night, 280 young men between 18 and 20 were missing or killed. So the, the younger generation was almost being wiped out on the demand. And there is the direction of the route itself. It was straight out of the, the east coast of England, right across um, Holland, and right deep into Germany. And it was a bit between um, just entering Holland and right up to the target area that you were being continually attacked by most, um, ME101, ME110s, ME 
109s and then the two 109s. And they would be foraging amongst the mainstream, looking for you, and consequently you would uh, just keep your eyeballs out all the time. I couldn't look out the airplane because I was too busy with my eyes on the chart. That's a quick copy of my first um, run over Germany. You see, the first one was Berlin. The next night we went to Leipzig. Then we went to Berlin again. Now, you can see there's a break, a break in between. It wasn't night after night. It was the 2nd and the 3rd of December. Then there was a bit of a break. Now, the reason for that, the weather was not permitting us to get out every night. It was cancelled because of fog, snow, returning to England, weather over Germany, and marking of targets. So you, during that period of stand down, we kept a little bit of training going. Now, the, the Y cross country was the original um, screen, the, the, the wiper screen which I read, read you now, and that was when it first came in. We called it H2S, and it made a highly, top, top, um, highly twice secret top secret, but we called it um, H2S, which was the name of that bloody smelly chemical stuff, and it stunk, but it, would, it worked anyway. And um, that's how we filled in, say, a week. But there are weeks when we were going out every other night. Now, the German reaction on route to us was the ME 109s, 110s, and the 2100s. Now, the 2100, I will tell you that that, uh, that sticks in my memory because on my last flight over Berlin coming home, a 210 chased us for nearly three hours across Germany. He would not go away. And the gunners were running out of ammunition firing at him. And finally, um, we tried one last resort. You carry very cartridges in the aircraft. These are, you have a gun with a big um, shell that goes into it and you fire it, it can either fire a green or a red cartridge. Now the, you use them on the ground for signalling rather than um, using radio. <clears throat> but the um, red cartridges we had in the aeroplane, we went back to the Astrodome where I used to have my sextant, opened it up, freezing cold, the air rushing in, and just pulled the trigger and fired these red cartridges in the direction of the 210. And after about firing 10 or 12 of them at it, he finally gave off and went on. He couldn't get, his, couldn't get into our sights, but I think he wondered what new weapon had we had, and he didn't come back anymore, he just shut it. Now, the, um, the German made our defences, the, the Freya and the giant Wurzbergs. Now, the giant Wurzbergs were the ground ones that controlled all the area you were flying through, and they could pick up and the reflection to the bombers on their screens. So how do we combat this? Well, we, I don't know if you've ever heard the term windows, so not the one you get on here. It was strips of metal paper, bundles and bundles of it, and we used to try it all out the airplane, and all those silver pieces in the sky, they would think they were all more airplanes. It was blot blotting out all their radar um, returns with hundreds of millions of these silver paper. And that's all we were doing all the time. Um, so that upset the Wordsbergs. Now the Freyers were the closer ones, but they used to hone the fighters in to a selected bomber if they could get it. And um, if you got caught by the Freybergs, you had to get worried. You, know, you didn't know, but you knew why the intensity of the attack and then the back up to in these radar sites. Now remember again that radar in those days was very primitive to what it is today. It was just coming into usage in warfare. They got flares on it once they decided what route you were flying into the target. You fucking rate a fuck of the Commodores, four engine aircraft the Germans had, you used to drop lines and lines of flares along your route. So it looked like you were going down Piccadilly into Oxford Circus, which would be the target, and you were illuminating all through the sky, and they were just taking a pick of you all the time, unless you were keeping your eye open. Um, that was the flares on the target, of course. And searchlights. Um, they weren't quite so dangerous, really, but once the masters, they weren't in, in threes. Once the master searchlight picked you up, the other two coming with you, and you, know, you might have got um, 
a bar of chocolate every fortnight if you had the number of points to go to the shop and do it. Now, one of the things was that um, my, my mother, when I used to come home on leave, I, I lived near Tower Bridge in South London actually, so when we used to go down the market on a Saturday morning, she'd say, the boy's home, a little bit on the meat, and he'd come out and he'd cut for a little bit more than the ration, because she had a son with her and he was home on leave. And we used to do little things like that, apart from the, uh, the characters that used to do black accents. And I say, just to show you how I've got lots of those here somewhere. Yeah. They're not just pictures, there they are. Okay? That's rations for meat and, and bread, which uh, you know, the, the Germans, they're full Russian. You can imagine after a bombing raid, seeing hundreds of those on the ground, you're going to pick them up quick. <coughs> That's a tough. Looks like a bit of what Berlin was done, something like that. This is down in the uh, Kirftenberg Centre, I think it is, yeah. Down the, under Den Linton. That's the main street that goes, or the main highway that goes through Germany up to the zoo area. And it's, um, and the Wilhelmstrasse, which crosses it, is something like being the centre of London, you know, around out Piccadilly and those places. So, um, when you did find pictures like that would be in that little blue handbook which um, you had access to to see whether you've done it. Now, one of the things on the bombing raid is that uh, when you drop your bombs, after you run for a few seconds or a few minutes, it dropped what they call a photo flash, which was a great big flash that blew up in the sky and illuminated the area and it took a picture of the ground that you'd gone over. Now, they call that the aiming point. Now, one of the games was who got the most aiming points on the squadron. Um, and if you didn't get an aiming point picture of where you should be, it wasn't at squadron level. Root wanted to know why you didn't get to the place you were designed to go. So it always preserved a record that you'd actually been to that place. Not that they didn't trust us, but sometimes you got a lot of thing called creep back. As the first bomb was at the fire swing, as soon as you came up, all, all here it is, all nervous, press your tip, that's your, your bomb tip, and then that you drop your bomb, and then slowly it would fall back that you wouldn't get to the target area, be about eight miles away possibly where you were bombing, and you hadn't hit the target area you were meant for. And of course the target area wasn't just a, a pinpoint operation, the whole idea was to smash an area of the city out and then come back for another night. Berlin being a big city, we took five, five suburbs of it out during my time. Just keep going back. Uh, this is the crew returning for the raid. <coughs> um, these are the newspapers at the time, and I was showing somebody out there. And I still have the real copies. And they're the treasure. Um, one of them here, which is most particular, I've had to keep it all under the trees of access. Ah, there we are. These are a couple of my ideal collections, which uh, you might see. That's a newspaper of the second day of World War II, and that is the RAF. From start to finish, the RAF Bomber Command was the only command, apart from I think it's the submarines, were on full duty of every day of the war, which is a long time in six years. So this is, and it's done by the blendings of um, the support force. And of course, picture of old, uh, Mr. Hitler at the back, uh, who caused all the problems. But the king had his crown and his lion on the front. That is the second day of the war. Does anybody recognise that? It's a picture of a lot of ships in the sea. And a picture of the English Channel, or a map of the English Channel. That's the day after D-Day, uh, when the 
going in, and here's all the, all the D-Day fleet. Now, it must be out the day after, which is dated the 7th of June, but you didn't have television, of course, so this is actual first front news of the, of the actual invasion. So there's the, the newspapers. There. Again, I've got lots of them at home, and I usually lay them out on the table when I go into schools. And then with a teacher supervising them, they can't, um, can't mess about. There's a couple more. You can see um, how much bombing was done overnight. The 300,000 tons. It's negligible compared to the new bomb these days, but it's quite a heavy delivery of um, ammunition to an enemy. There's your five. 5,000 pounders that they started dropping during the war. I never had those on board. They were like the uh, down buses. They were specialist crews. This is rather a sad thing. We lost 87,000 casualties during the war. 56 500 were killed or missing. And the average air crew was 19 to 22. No older than most of you cadets now. I, I was a cadet for three months, but it wasn't in the ATC. It was called the Air Defence Cadet Corps of Great Britain. And I joined it in 1939. I didn't join it because it was a war. I joined it because you got bloody good pictures of aeroplanes sent here once a month. <laughs> I had no thoughts of aeroplanes. My plan of life was boats. Um, These, um, these are my operational medals, as you can see. The first one is a trite one, is the um, Distinguished Flying Medal, which um, I was given to by His Majesty King George VI at Buckingham Palace in, the, uh, in 1945. It was awarded in 1944 during operations. I've got the London Gazette at home, but uh, with so many people getting medals, um, they were quite a cure at Buckingham Palace. I mean, um, he, he was working all day picking them on people and that. So when I went in there, it was, uh, I, I think there's about uh, 150 people being um, given medals by His Majesty. But that's a very interesting thing too, because <laughs> what happens is, I'll tell you about it, you get to the gates of Buck House and you go in and you're escorted by a, a constable and you're taken to the main entrance and uh, round the back the main entrance, the side entrance um, for the guests to come in. And they take you in and put you, assemble you in this big room and then uh, you hang about there and you, you're told what you are going to have to do and uh, then you just um, wait for your name to be called. You come out the door and you're in the state room and you, your friends and relatives are sitting there watching the, the uh, Thing. And then on the stage, or this platform above, so sloping walkway going up, and you walk up the slope way to His Majesty, who has his itinerary around him. And what you have to do is you have to bow your head, step forward, stand there like that, ask a couple of questions, and he asked me how many ox I'd done and what I was doing now. Then you stand back, and then you bow your head because you don't have your hat on in Paris, but suddenly I made a balls of it. <laughs> <laughs> I went up the ramp, turned and faced him, stepped forward, bang, hit him in the chest. Got <laughs> <laughs> back, oh my god. <laughs> anyway, he, he was all right, and he wasn't stuttering at the time. I think he had his phrases in there, because King George used to stutter a lot. Right. When you go down the other end of the slope, at one end is a, a yeoman of the guard standing there with his pike and says, okay, up you go. And mm -hmm. the other one at the other end is, Pit takes your medal off where you, puts it in the box, outside for a smoke. <laughs> and then that went on. That's an investment. Quite funny, actually. Um, oh, that's a plan that for this. But, um, Going a bit deeper into the training now, that's a, the brief outline of what I do on the bombing of Berlin. It was not only um, a bit of fun, but uh, war is serious. It, it's uh, 
theme that I don't uh, like to see going on a lot now, but I think we all do that of age. And the, um, the thing is, on the squadron, squadron life was still going on just as it does in peacetime today. We had our little rest evenings. We didn't have our lovely, wonderful um, feasts like we do at Wing Dinners in like we were the other week. Don't get it like that. Um, but uh, we used to just have the usual games of football, play in the, in the parking area of the aircraft. Uh, you used to go down the hangars, and uh, particularly if it was your own aeroplane, and mine was six, six feet, um, anyway, I've got the number there. You got the, you kept the same Lancaster as you flew in until you go and leave a couple of times and you come back. And of course the aircraft doesn't stay still. You come back and you find that some other crew had not returned from the bombing mission and you had a bright new airplane to come back from Chatterton again and uh, you had to develop that in your own way again. So you don't keep the same number until it's lost on operation by some other crew except your own. <laughs> but um, we had a very good ground crew. We had a Canadian lad. Um, we always flew S for Sugar, but he named it S for Sandra, which um, he had his bit Sandra on the side of his aircraft paint, uh, painted on the nose, and that was his special aeroplane. As a matter of fact, my daughter's second name now is Sandra, <laughs> so, so I gave that in memory of it. But um, uh, the uh, the, the ground crew, we used to take them out and have a beer with them in the village, down at East Kirkby Village where we were. A little tiny village in, in the middle of the wolds of Lincolnshire. And the, the two pubs in there used to say, oh dear, busy tonight, there's no ox on. But if there was ox on that night, that village was sealed off. You couldn't telephone out of it and all the people, the inhabitants of the village, couldn't contact the outside world. Because one slip of the target area, which happened at Nuremberg, which was a, a disaster for bombing command, they lost 94 airplanes at one night at Nuremberg. Now fortunately, I avoided that, or my crew avoided that. We were supposed to go and leave, and the flight commander said to uh, Robert's crew, was my captain, no leave tonight, it, it's full effort. So we didn't go that night weather. Second night, we still wouldn't let's go and leave, full effort. So he scrubbed again. The following morning, he weakened the seal. He said, right, he said, you've had about two long, go and leave. And I was on leave the next morning, down in London. My mum brought me up my tea in bed and the paper, because my dad worked at the Evening News in London. And there it was, 94, 94 bombers come down on the Euro. And I went, oh, <laughs> I would have been on that if it had been there another 24 hours. Yeah. That was it. Um, day to day life in England at wartime was um, pretty um, hectic. Um, I used to go on leave and I could go on EOS and um, uh, had a better, a better time than my two brother in laws who were out in the desert. One got um, killed at our. At, um, Salerno on the Italian uh, coast. The other one came right through he, and he, he was in the tank regiment. And he didn't get home until one year after the war ended, unfortunately. Because they get the troops home took a long time. But uh, yeah, I used to go on one leave, meet my girlfriend, in future became my wife. And um, we used to go to the cinema and the theatre if, if they were open. Sometimes the bombing raids would uh, destroy a few of them in London, mainly where I, I used to spend my time up in the West End, amongst all the Yanks <laughs> with the money was, because we were, uh, I was only doing all this on four pounds a week, um, bombing journey, that was, and not some money, because the soldier was only getting about two pounds fifty. So, you know, it, it, not too bad, all right. Um, didn't uh, go on, you couldn't go near any of the um, holiday resorts because the land was locked against invasion by the German forces, which uh, we thought would come, but it never did. So life in general was not too bad. Um, I was, what, 19, mainly, throughout that period, and I thoroughly enjoyed what I was doing. And um, a lot of people say to me, were you frightened? And were you scared? And I can't ever recall being scared because, um, again, just a little bit older than what you lot are now, except the back row, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, 
you know, you, you don't feel scared, you're just having a bit of fun. And all I had for, for my days at school was um, a, a bicycle. I'd go back and forward to school from South London to North London, where my college was. And uh, suddenly I'm presented with six mates and a great big four-engine monster, which was all ours. And what more could you want? <laughs> Apart from going on holiday with it, you couldn't take it anywhere other than east to west and back again. Anyway, um, is there any questions anybody would like to ask at all? Hey, what, John, you hold that, hold that there, we'll have some break, and then we'll come back for some questions after the break. Okay. I sound like on TV. Uh, it's quite hard to understand, I think, sometimes, just how difficult it was. You know, the losses for Bomber Band were unbelievable. If you've ever been to Berlin, Berlin is a fantastic city now. It's absolutely beautiful. But one thing you notice about Berlin, it's modern. There's, there's very few of the buildings still standing. So it's a very interesting place to go and have a look at. Uh, so, George is here. Uh, probably just have about 20 minutes or 15 minutes if you've got to ask him anything about flying training, about the Lancaster, about navigation. Is it always on navigation? Much more expensive than I am to have uh, You're quite welcome to do so. so. So far away, any questions? Yes. Do you remember what you said uh, about in the evidence book that you'd get um, like numbers where Berlin had been bombed? Yeah. Did you ever stop to think about like the people who you bombed, like accidentally? Mm -hmm. No, the question was that um, did I ever think about the innocent people down below in, in the target area? No. You were up there doing the job. The first thing was to do as you were told by high command, bring the aircraft, aircraft safely home and your own body with you. Now, sadly, um, and I do say when I go into schools and tell them, war isn't fun. Throw your uh, pee boxes and things out the window. Nobody wins a war. There's a victor, but everybody loses. Lovers, separations, homes. That's the main thing. I thought about that after the war, but sadly, at the time of the operation, it does not enter your head. But, um, I feel commissioners in that for them, but, but I'm here. But there's a lot more things to know. What sort of equipment did you have in the plane for, well, like, to use while you're navigating? Well, I don't know if you still use it in the ATC, but we used to use the um, little calculator or a computer that uh, we used to use that for working out speeds and things. The question is how instrumentation is used apart from it, and a pair of slide rules which you stood up and down on a chart. Um, dividers of course for measuring distances. All rather primitive in its own way. But for normal navigational purposes you use a sextant. Now when you're on target bombing, you don't use sextants that. You're not going to stand in an aeroplane with an astrodome and an Lancaster wobbling below you trying to shoot the stars. The route was fixed for you by the mosquitoes. So the navigation was something like it is today in the modern aeroplane is beacon to beacon. But beware, a beacon being a flare in the sky from a mosquito would be a turning point to that place and a turning point to that place. Don't hang about there because that's where the fighters would be sitting. Every time a mosquito dropped a flare, he knew that the people were going to be in the vicinity of that flare. But apart from that, it's just an ordinary chart, um, the basic electronics we had, a slide roller, not a slide roller, um, parallel rulers, and, and a little adult computer. I could have brought all these bits in with me, but again, with you, you, it wants laying out on the table so you can see them. But uh, if Sir, I would like to go in my car. Mm -hmm. you'll, you'll put, there's a big bag on the back seat, and it will be my. No, you're fine, it's a big bag. Yeah. But, yeah. So, just point out about the computer, he's not a modern day computer by any stretch of his imagination, it's yeah. a mechanical uh, computer that's spinning on some wheels and calculates speed. So, don't think you want to use your head with it, it's not a, a modern day thing. I think you used to use them in training, they don't use them anyway, because. Um, the whole system of navigators, they don't have navigators now, of course, as far as I know, they're systems operators, and they've got all this wonderful equipment. So, yeah, they answer your question, very basic, but not a lot of actual 
astronaut, astronaut grenades, astronomical navigation, what we use in years crossing the Atlantic and that. Sorry. Or is it like being a grown What was that? Being a grown The question was, was it like being a grown I've never got being a grown gunner. I don't know. I missed out because they made me an observer. And, uh, I, I tried to join that one. My, my friend got a grown gunner because we didn't have quite long navigational schemes um, that I had. Um, yeah. How many days did you get off? Yeah. 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 Well, the question was, how many days we got off? You didn't get any days off. You were there on the squadron to go out whenever you were um, ready to go. Now, unfortunately, the weather in England and the winter and the weather in Germany made a lot of days off for us. But don't think we sat in the crew room all the time. We used to go out and do flying training across countries, landings and takeoffs. All the normal thing that a pilot does when he's not doing his operational duties. So that's our big desert. But having said that, we still got our 10 days, oh yeah, always 10 days leave. You went off on a Monday and came back on the following Thursday week, something like that. So you did get regular leave duty. As I was telling you earlier, fortunately, I got away on leave with my crew at the night that the Nuremberg raid took place. It's because it's right in the middle of the period that we were doing the uh, annihilation of the city of Germany. Governor? Yes. If you went on the Berlin raid, yes. what time did you take off and what time did you return? Again, barely. Now, it gets dark in England about 4 o'clock in the winter, November, December, and <coughs> March, which was the bombing during that period. So it varied. Sometimes we got off at about 7 o'clock in the evening, which meant that you had two hours before takeoff, um, plus a meal before takeoff. I'll tell you about that in a minute. It's um, yeah, about 7 o'clock. And you get home about in the quite the early hours of the morning. And then the, the average trip was about 7 to 8 hours. So 7 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, time you got back, that was it. Um, if it's a midnight takeoff, of course, it would be dawn the time you got back. Now, it's a, on one incident, um, the, um, uh, the airfield was just uh, about 20 miles to the west of Skegness. And we used to, as we come coming up, we dropped very low over the North Sea and it comes screaming in. And at Butlin's holiday camp, I don't know if uh, you know about that, they used to have a holiday camp at Skegness. And uh, it, it was kept man manned by the sailors. Uh, there was a sailor's training area. Um, and we're coming in low, and they always stand, this is on the dawn return, we'll be standing on parade, and this monstrous thing will come over at about 50 feet, rocket across, and land about 15 miles away where we were based. Uh, go to bed after a few uh, food and that. Next, next day, or the year, that same day, called into the flight commander's office. He had a very rude telephone call from the, the man who runs the naval base. That crew have been doing it again, and we did it on numerous occasions. So <laughs> the same as did the same as the least don't we? We had to stop doing it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Andrew. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Right, what, what Shout was out. Like, what was it like when you went home to your family like, when you were on Well, I didn't tell them a lot. My mum didn't want me to go to sea and she didn't I'm very happy when I joined the Air Force. In fact, um, I got the call up papers and we used to have a mirror in the fireplace and there was a buff envelope and my dad had got home from work before I came in and he said, Do you know what that is? I said, No, I don't know. He said, Do you call up? I said, Oh is it? He said, Yeah, but you're not old enough because you'll have to be conscripted. And that, in those days, you were 21 to be an adult. Nowadays, you're 18. So, he said, your mother will kill you when she comes in. Anyway, she did. She ranted and raved, went off her head. My dad softened her down and said, in a year's time, they take me and put me where they want. He's going where he likes. And then from that moment, she's a very proud woman. And when I came home from South Africa, with three big stripes and a big shining O on here. She was a hundred man. <laughs> That's how she took it. Yeah. 
Uh, some of the, you know, the question at the moment, but one of the things was um, most of the bases for the Pommel Cruise were in Suffolk, Norfolk, and Lincolnshire and Yorkshire, all on the east side of England, but mainly in um, Lincolnshire, most of the bombers were. Um, and I was in what they call five group, and we Butch Harris's own group. That's where we picked all these elite crews from, the Dan Busters and uh, Turpins, and all came, out, all came out five group. So you felt highly privileged to be in five group, but when you went into Lincoln or Boston, you didn't see anybody in civics, it was just one town of RAF blue. Everywhere you went, it was blue. The pubs, um, the coffee shops, uh, the cinemas, if they were open, things like that. So, consequently, you never saw hardly a civilian around. It was an Air Force blue. And I think there's a guy died the other day. They sold his um, VC. Um, he got, he got 237,000 for it or something. And uh, I can't think of his name now. But we used to go to the skating ring in Boston, and I remember bumping into him, and it, you know, it, it was just all the Scots lad that brought home a flaming bomber. I mean, a flaming bomber. Um, but uh, he had to be seen. He was quite a nice guy. He died the other week. Yeah. Yes, sir. What types of aircraft are you actually flown in? You know, in your area. Well, I start off with uh, the, the war, of course. My first flight was an air cadet, which I say are not quite the same air cadets as you are. I flew in that uh, Lysander. It's a, a monoplane airplane with a backward looking gun turret and a pilot up front. And I flew that at an air place called Croydon Airport, which was London's famous airport before the war. Um, then I graduated onto. Um, Anderson's when I did my navigational training in South Africa. I did my navigation on that in South Africa, a place called Port Alfred, and I did my final navigational training on Oxford, which is a little bit faster than Anderson. That was in South Africa. And I came home, and lo and behold, I went up to uh, Dun Dun Dumfries, that's the place called it, and to get familiarised to fly over England in both day and night. I flew in a boffer, which was a torpedo bomber, and um, sad to behold, that's where I had my first crash. <laughs> we took off on Dumfries Airfield in a boffer, and a starboard engine fell out. And we uh, just got off the ground, and the pilot managed to get it on the ground, overshot the runway, went right through into the field beyond, and some stupid Scott farmer had dug a big ditch, and the airplane nose went in. The airplane went up like that. I went through the top hatch, we finished up 10 yards away, and we bum in the mud. And before I looked around, there was a group captain, the station commander, and a, and a medical officer. And he said, Are you all right? I said, Yes, I'm all right. He said, Right, down sit quarters, we're for checking out. That's all it is. Yeah, Boffer. Um, Boffer, we went on to um, Wellington's to get uh, a crew. A bit of a crewing up for a period. That was down at a well known airfield, which is now in the South of England, is a motor racing track. It's with an S. Silverstone. Yeah, that's it. Um, on from there, we went up to uh, Weeksley, outside of Lincoln, where we did 10 hours of multi engine training for the tour engines. And as I was saying to, uh, to uh, say that the, we, we didn't use all the Lancasters for training, they kept as many operating. So we did our first 10 hours on uh, four engine aircraft on Halifaxes. Then I graduated to Lancasters. At the end of the Lancasters, I went on to Lincoln's, ready to go on to Japan. But fortunately, the Americans dropped this atomic bomb, so we just cut our ties off at the neck, threw our tin hats in, in the trees in um, Pembroke which obviously uh, is still up there. <laughs> so the beat about that. And the gas masks are still behaving up there. And then um, I left the service, came back in, and this is post-war. I went back onto Lancaster's. Then I went on to the Super Fortresses, the B-29s at Collinsby, till they handed them back to the States. Then I posted on the fly boats, where I did a tour in England and a tour in the Far East. Came back, went on to Hastings, Went back to Singapore, did another tour there, came back, and then 
onto the mighty Brits, and various other twilly aeroplanes in his room. And that's, uh, that was a flying career. And if anybody can get in the service and get a flying career, or even career in the service, stay with it. It's, it's a good life, and it's well paid. Yeah. George, I know you've flown in a lot of aircraft, and we would talk quite a lot about it. Do you, do you have a real preference for anywhere, anything you really enjoy more than the others? Yes, I did actually. Um, it was it was the Britannia, mm -hmm. but my second love is a flying boat. Mm -hmm. I love the Britannia. It was pretty charming. I was at I was at a reunion last week down at Bryce Lawn actually, and my son and I were there down to Pembroke Dock to uh, to have a look at the sun uh, the flying boat. But they had the Sunderland so yeah, and it was closed anyway. So Monday and Tuesday I was at to Dutchford. And all those aircraft flight jets mentioned were there. And my son was over the moon. He said, Oh, Dad, you did that one. You know, and he's 65 years old, my son. He may not actually want to be the kid. I remember it because he used to go to school. Yeah. Um, what, uh, just a thing. You know how in services, at most airlines, you have to have a certificate of service before you go to the Air Force? Yes. Take five, but five years of the war, I was in the Air Force. I left the Air Force, and about two or three months later, I had a letter from the ministry, or the Air Ministry, it was then, saying, will you come back in, in terms like that? We've got lots of airplanes on the ground, nobody to fly in. So I went uh, back to the unit, I and I went down to, um, I think, the land airfield out in Essex. I had to report there, and um, I had a medical, and uh, they said, you're still fit for flying. Um, can you come back at such a day? I was now married, by the way, and I had to put words to my wife. What do you feel like? And she said, well, I think you'll enjoy it, yeah. I said, well, you'll be joining me sometime. So I went back in after six months or so after the war ended. I signed up for eight years, and you got a gratuity of £7,000. It was a lot of money then. I thought, I'll have some of this. And uh, I signed on for the eight years. In the net between, I was asked to, I went to the um, city group captain, and he said, Will you um, serve for 22 years? So I said, Give me a moment, and a couple of days, spoke with my wife, okay, signed for 22. In the meantime, then, that period, they brought out a scheme to the age of 55. And you asked if you wanted to stay. I love flying, so I stayed till 55. And at 55, I came up and I come home on leave. Just started on my leave, and I was living in Little Lever at the time. I'd been in, in the office in Great Moor Street. And uh, the chap again at the airman she rung up and he said, Oh, George. He said, It's David. And it was my wartime captain. He said, Yep. He said, will you do three years and go to Germany? I said, no. I said, I've had enough travelling. Consequently, I turned to the wife and said, he's offered you Germany, you always want to go there. I said, no. So we came back the next day and said, will you do three years and go to leaving? I went to leaving, which took me on to the age of 58. This was 19, 1981. And then as I was clearing the office at Finningley when I finished up, and flight commander called me in and said, uh, the boss says, will you stay until you're 60? <laughs> so I went, <laughs> <laughs> I think I've had enough. My wife wants to see me again.